Okay, welcome to Economics 231. This is Chapter 16, Business Cycles and Unemployment. And we'll get started right away. I'm um, trying to keep these videos short. Um, we're going to briefly go over uh, some of the material, but not all of the material. Um, these chapters will answer three questions, what business cycles are, how they're measured. We will not answer what causes business cycles. We'll talk about that later. And what is unemployment? Okay, so what is a business cycle? Your book says it's alternating periods of economic growth and contraction, which can be measured by changes in real GDP. And if you remember from chapter 15, when we calculate real GDP, we take nominal GDP as it is tabulated in the current year. Then we divide that by the GDP chain price index. Okay, once you've done that, you multiply the whole thing by 100, to get rid of the pretty hundred we put into the GDP chain price index that will give you real GDP okay now your book says there are four phases of the business cycle we'll go we'll look at them uh, I'm gonna tell you there's probably a fifth uh, they've got peak recession trough and expansion okay I would add boom peak recession trough and then recovery so what is a peak? A peak is where GDP is at its maximum. Real GDP is at its maximum as after rising during a recovery, or in this case, really a boom. Okay. A recession is a downturn in the business cycle during which real GDP declines and unemployment rate rises, also called a contraction or a bust. Okay. Now, uh, the government, our government generally, uh, as a general rule, says that in order for the economy to be in a recession, a bust, a downturn, contraction, whatever you want to call it, those are all names for the same thing, um, that you have to have two consecutive quarters of real GDP decline. Okay, so you're going to wait two, two quarters. That's, that's a bit of a problem because we won't acknowledge we're in a recession until we've already been in one for roughly at least six months. Okay, and this just is, when is a downturn considered a depression? There is no real economic term there. We've used different terms for the same thing. We've called them panics, crisis, recessions, depressions, downturns, contractions, busts. All of those are the same word. We usually will reserve the word depression for a severely deep and long re recession like the one that happened in the 1930s, the Great Depression. But the terms are all interchangeable. They just keep changing them. Okay, trough is where GDP is at its, at its minimum after falling during a recession. And then what your book calls the recovery, or I call recovery, they call expansion, an upturn in the business cycle during which real GDP rises, also called an expansion. So here we have a hypothetical uh, business cycle. You can see here that we've got a peak here and a peak here. So the, the business cycle, according to your book, occurs over this period. We get a peak followed by a decline in real GDP. That's the recession, then the trough, then an expansion, according to your book, followed by a peak. Okay, I would say we have a boom followed by a peak then a recession followed by a trough, and then a recovery. We don't necessarily have to have this expansion, or what they call an expansion. That's what I would call a boom. Now, when we look at these things, how you view them is based on what you think about business cycles. If you think they are inherent in capitalism, then it's just this unending up and down, up and down, snaking sort of pattern, okay? There's no real difference between this and this, this bottom part here, where if we didn't have another boom, it would just level off, return back to what we call secular levels of output. Okay, and this is always done around a growth trend line. This is where the economy should be if it followed the economist models, what we would call potential real GDP, okay, or full employment GDP, we'll also call it that. 
So here, we're up above this growth trend line where the economy should be, okay? And they're calling that an expansion. I would call this part right here a recovery. And then once we get up here, another boom. If you believe that business cycles are not inherent in capitalism, then they're caused by something outside the capitalist system. So here, we're below the trend line. The economy will recover and get back to this trend line here. But if it goes up above it, that would be the start of another business cycle, a boom. We don't have to have that business cycle. It's caused by institutions outside the capitalist system, namely governments, government central banks, and our fractional reserve banking system. Okay. Now here you can see the severity of post-war depressions. Um, we're excluding the Great Depression. Most mainstream economists do. Okay. 11 months, 10 months. Okay. Peak unemployment rates. Okay, December 2007 to July 2009, the most recent one, 9.7. We'll talk about those unemployment rates later. We're going to skip through some slides here. You can see here, there's the Great Depression right here. Starts um, <clears throat> in 29 after the Great Crash. You can see here it bottoms out in 1930. Then we get a temporary recovery here and another uh, short, quick recession here. Economy booms according to, to GDP numbers because of the war. A short depression here at the end of the war. Okay, and you can see that's the pattern. Okay, um, here are international comparisons of GDP growth rates as of 2014. You can see China and India here have very high growth rates, United, followed by the United States, United Kingdom, and as we move on down here, Germany, Japan, Greece. Um, your book talks about economic indicators. The first one we have is a leading indicator. This is this is a variable that variables that change before real GDP changes. A lot of economists, forecasters like to look at these leading indicators to see what they're doing that's an indication of what the economy could be doing in the future because they change before real GDP changes. Some of the leading indicators, average work week, unemployment claims is a big one, new consumer goods orders, delayed deliveries, new orders for plants and equipment, new building permits, stock prices, money supply, interest rates, consumer expectations. Okay, average work week, would tend to be directly related to future changes in output, along with unemployment claims. If these go if these go down, the economy will go up in the future, possibly. If these go up, the economy will go down. New consumer orders. If these go down, we expect the economy to go down in the future. They're directly related. Delayed deliveries. The more delayed deliveries there are, the better the economy is doing because it's it's exceeding the transportation uh, network. So that would be directly related. New orders for plants and equipment, directly related. New building permits, directly related. Stock prices, directly related. Money supply, directly related. Now as an Austrian, I would say that this is what causes the business cycle here. Changes in the money supply that enter into credit markets first. Interest rates, the opposite, okay? inversely related. Consumer expectations, directly related. Coincident indicators. These are things we would use to see if, to find out what's going on right now. These are things that generally change with GDP at the same time. Coincident indicators, non-agricultural payrolls, personal income minus transfer payments, industrial production, manufacturing and trade sales, all directly related to how the economy is doing at the current time. And finally, a lagging indicator. This, these are variables that change after real GDP changes. So we could kind of look at these and see if what's happened in the past and sort of verify it or justify it. And those lagging indicators are unemployment rate, duration of unemployment, loss cost per unit of output, labor cost per unit of output, uh, 
these tend to be um, lagging indicators, consumer price indexes for services, commercial and industrial loans, commercial credit to personal income ratio, and the prime interest rate. Okay. Now your book says changes in total spending cause the business cycle, and that's the Keynesian view. Investment spending is viewed as being irrational by the Keynesians, driven by animal spirits. So if investment spending is down because of low animal spirits, that would cause real GDP to decrease. If investment spending increases, that would increase spending and increase real GDP. Real output is determined by spending in the Keynesian model. Okay. Uh, another big part of this chapter is unemployment rate. And when we talk about the unemployment rate, we typically talk about the civilian unemployment rate. That is the percentage change of people in the civilian labor force who are without jobs and are actively seeking jobs. Okay. How is this unemployment rate calculated? Okay, I'm going to go. You'll see it here in writing. Each month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys 60,000 households at random. They used to do it by phone survey. Um, now they've added some face-to-face -face because uh, oftentimes people who are unemployed don't have a phone, so you can't call them. All right, what is the civilian labor force? This is important. These are people 16 years or older who are either employed or actively seeking a job excluding members of the armed forces, homemakers, and people in institutions. If you're in jail, you're not part of the civilian labor force. If you are in the military, you're not part. This, getting rid of people in the armed services here, this is supposed to make this statistic more responsive to changes in output. Um, the number of people in the military is based on you know, how many national security needs, how many people we think we need to bomb, how many wars are going on, whatever, but not based on the economy. So we pull them out of the workforce. That makes this number more responsive to changes in output. Homemakers, people who are not looking for jobs, don't want jobs. They're out of the workforce. They're not unemployed. They're out of the workforce. Okay, so what do you have to be or do to be considered uh, employed? Okay, anyone who works at least one hour a week for pay or at least 15 hours per week as an unpaid worker in a family business is considered employed. Okay, and that's a problem with the statistics because we don't look to see if people are underemployed. Are they working in jobs beneath them? Or are they working part-time when they want to work full-time? If you've got a job one hour a week for pay or 15 hours per week unpaid in a family business, you're employed, according to the statistic. Okay, here's a good one. Pay attention to this one. Well, who is considered unemployed? Anyone who is 16 years of age and above who is actively seeking employment. You have to be actively seeking a job. You have to fill out a job app. You have to go to a job agency, a headhunter. You have to go for interviews or job fairs. You have to be looking for a job. If you're, say, a 16-year-old or per above, and you're sitting on the couch eating, you know, eating bonbons and watching TV and not looking for a job, you are not unemployed. Your grandma, who's on Social Security, Okay, she's not looking for a job. She's not unemployed. We also have a group of people who are not included in this statistic, and this is another problem with it. These are people we call discouraged workers. These are people who want to work, but for various reasons have given up a job search. So these are people who want and or need to work. But for whatever reason, they've stopped looking for a job. Maybe they got depressed. Maybe they got sick. Maybe they, they um, decided for whatever reason, I'm not going to go look for a job even though they want one. Those people are called discouraged workers. GDP, I mean, excuse me, the civilian unemployment rate does not include these people. The longer someone's been out of work, the more likely it is they become a discouraged worker and give up looking for a job. 
we care about those people. They want jobs. They need to be working, but they're not. But they don't count as being in the labor force because they're not looking for a job. They're sitting on the couch. They're sleeping in. They're moping. Whatever the reason or whatever they're doing, they're not looking for a job even though they don't have one and they want one. Those people are called discouraged workers. So here's a quick list of people who are in the civilian labor force, people who are employed or self-employed, and that includes working in a family business. So if your dad owns a, I, I used to know a guy, he owned a convenience store, and he had his kids working in a convenience store. Those kids, even if he wasn't paying them, are counted as unemployed if they're working 15 per week, hours per week or more. Or if you're a farmer and you got your kids out there working in the field, or your wife working in the field 15 hours per week or more, they are counted as being employed, even if they're not being paid a salary or a paycheck. Okay, Unemployed, new entrance to the job force. Say a 16-year-old person just turned 16 and they start looking for a job. They've got to be looking for a job. They would be considered unemployed. Re-entrance, people who are re-entering the workforce. Maybe uh, a housewife who's had children and says, I'm going to wait till they get in school before I go look for work. Now the kids are five years and older and they're in kindergarten or grade school. And she decides to re-enter the workforce. Also, criminals, people who've been put away, convicts. They've been locked up. They're not in the workforce, right? Because they're institutionalized. But now they're freed and they start looking for a job. They would be considered, considered re-entrance. People who lost their last job, people who got fired, people who quit their last job, and people who are laid off. Those are all considered part of the civilian workforce. These people are unemployed, these people are employed. People not in the labor force, armed forces, we talked about household workers, students who aren't looking for jobs, retirees, your grandma, persons with disabilities, people in institutions, and then those discouraged workers. That's a big problem. Okay. We'd like to count them, but we don't because they're not looking for a job, so they're out of the workforce. The unemployment rate is the number of unemployed people. That's these people in this bottom yellow box, divided by the civilian labor force. That's the people in both boxes. So the civilian labor force includes the number of people who are employed plus the number of people who are unemployed. The civilian labor force does not include discouraged workers. You've got to remember that. Then we multiply that, think of that as 100% to make it look pretty again. Okay, so here we have a quick calculation. Number of persons in the millions, people who are 16 and over, okay, not in the labor force. These are, going back here, all these people in the blue box. They are over 16, but they're not in the labor force. So the civilian labor force would be 155.9 million people in 2014. The number of people who had jobs was 146.3 million. 9.6 million people are unemployed. These two numbers here add up to the civilian workforce. So we take the number of people who have a job, who are employed, we divide it by the number of people who are employed and unemployed, the civilian workforce. That's the people in this yellow box, both of them, employed and unemployed. We add them together, that's the civilian labor force. Then we multiply that number by 100% because we would have gotten 0 0.062. We multiply it by 100% to make it a percentage and the civilian unemployment rate in 2014 was 6.2%. Here we're looking at the US unemployment rate. Um, you can see that it reached almost 25% during the Great Depression, and that's a really big number, okay? You can see we haven't achieved that number anywhere close, although it depends on how you calculate the rate. They changed it over the years. But here, those were generally, people in the workforce were generally men, head of the household. So that means roughly one quarter of all families during the depth of the Great Depression did not have someone out working with a, with, with a regular income. They were unemployed. Here, during our most recent recession, 
unemployment came up close to 10% using the civilian unemployment rate. Here we have different countries and their unemployment rates. Greece, South Africa, very high unemployment rates in 2014. Greece was going through a, a, a crisis. Um, they, they had, the Greek government was, for all intents and purposes, bankrupt and getting bailed out. Greece has a large labor union contingent. Greece has um, a lot of people working in government jobs. Those people were laid off because the IMF imposed austerity measures onto their government. Uh, South Africa, 25.2%. Um, you can see these two are highest. Look here, United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and these are the unemployment rates in different countries in 2014. Okay. Big problem with the un civilian unemployment rate is that it does not include discouraged workers. It includes part-time workers, and it does not measure under underemployment. So those are problems with the civilian unemployment rate. We're going to stop here. Thank you. It'll be a short quiz. Have a great day.